But thank you all so much for joining us for exploring the Blackstone River Valley National Historic Park. Along the Blackstone River, a number of enterprising colonists and their descendants started businesses that would change the course of history. Discover how large corporations grew out of small mill villages in the 19th century. While focusing on a few case studies in labor history, we're going to examine the beginnings of industry in the United States. And so we're going to learn about this National Historical Park with Park Ranger Allison Horrocks. I again want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library and the other 35 partnering libraries for helping us spread the word about today's program. So all 120 of us or so who are watching live, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Allison for joining us this afternoon. And Allison, you can take it away. Thanks so much. No, thank you for having me. And I'm coming to you today from Rhode Island. So don't hold that against me, but it's wonderful to see so many folks from Massachusetts and from all over the country. So I'm going to dive right into my presentation. And as he mentioned at the beginning, I'd love to take your questions at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, my presentation. Not quite big enough here, let's see. Okay. So I'm coming to you today from the Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park where I am a park ranger. I so actually Allison, had- can I, can I uh, Yes, yes, I'm please, sorry. yes. So can you um, try um, making the slide full screen? Is there an ability to do that? Yes, In I'm very glad you, you told me. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. of course, now it doesn't, it doesn't look right. Let's see. So that is not showing like a slideshow. Right, so we're seeing most of the first screen, but I can also see like the ribbon on top. I can see the next eight oh, slides on the left. Oh, okay, that is not what I see. So my my apologies for that. Um, if you want, um, maybe uh, unshare and then share again. I don't know. Yeah, if that's make let me let me but... do that super briefly. Sorry about that, folks. That's okay. If we're going to have technical difficulties, it's good to have them at the beginning and work them out. It certainly is. You can practice and then. Okay. And Allison's trying to be fancy and use a Mac, so I know. Uh... <laughs> Uh, that that is actually uh, part part of my introduction. I was going to talk about why I am doing things a little bit differently than I typically would. So let's go ahead and do that. How is that working? That is perfect. That's full okay. screen. Great job. Well, I didn't plan this, nor did I plan my work computer effectively breaking completely yesterday. But I did actually want to talk about that because. The park that I am associated with, and I'll discuss the origins of the park and a lot of what we do, but one of the big things that we're concerned with in the Blackstone River Valley is people's relationships with technology and with machines. And as I was preparing this talk this week, I felt a bit betrayed by a machine that I use very frequently, which is my work computer, as well as now my personal computer, I can add to that. The machines that we use how we interact with them, right? They are such a big part of our life. And we also have this very interesting relationship with the technology that defines us. Often we have no role in making it and it can be very hard to fix it. It took four people to get a fan to fix my computer because I'm not allowed to open the back of it. It's not something that the technicians want you to be doing. And I'm always very curious about how the world has come to be the way that it is, how we get to share this experience during what might be your lunch hour. Where do lunch hours come from, right? So all these questions about technology and labor history, that's what I do every day as a park ranger at Blackstone River Valley. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is, uh, I wish I could say I planned that. I absolutely didn't. 
So I want to give you some background. The Blackstone River is at the core of our story, and this is a view basically out my front yard. So I happen to live right in front of the Blackstone River. And part of what I love about being a park ranger is it gives me tools to better understand the world around me. This is the Blackstone River. Very near to it are remnants of the Blackstone Canal. And I'll be talking today about how this natural waterway and how this human-made waterway and infrastructure not only flow through this entire valley, but help us to define and understand this landmass that we call the Blackstone River Valley. Whenever I talk about a place in this area, it comprises 26 communities from Worcester, Massachusetts, to Providence, Rhode Island, where I am today, people are always what's very important to us. When we talk about a machine or we talk about a change in technology, we're very curious at this park about how people played a role in making that thing or experiencing that change. So people and human labor are really always at the forefront of what we do. We also work very hard as a community-oriented park to be both part of a community and to be an agent for change in that community. Folks frequently ask me what I do on a daily basis. I took these photos a few weeks apart last uh, year, and this is kind of a good synopsis of what I actually do. I might be giving a tour of a historic mill. I might be awarding a dog a bark ranger badge for their agreement to be a good pup visitor to one of our sites, or I might be working with a group like the Audubon Society to do education about the natural world. So we are a historical park, but we live in nature and we are part of a community. And that's also a big piece of what we do as well. To actually define the park in a bit clearer terms, there are six places and countless stories. The place where I spend most of my time is at the Old Slater Mill National Historic Landmark, and that is in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Not far from there are the Blackstone River State Park and the Ashton Mill Village, followed by the Slatersville Mill Village, Whitensville, Massachusetts, and Hopedale, Massachusetts. The green box that you see on the map that I've included here today includes an outline of what actually makes up the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. That is a colloquial term, and it's also a term that has real meaning. And the line that runs through it is, of course, the Blackstone River. I'll be taking us to each of these places where there is an arrowhead marked on the map today, starting with Slater Mill and ending with that last six site in Hopedale, Massachusetts. Where the park comes from is its larger category, which is the National Heritage Corridor. Over 30 years ago, the National Heritage Corridor was created largely as an economic driver or as part of an economic engine and plan for change in this area. If you have lived around New England, you know that in the 1970s and 1980s, that was a big period of continued deindustrialization. It had started earlier, but it was a real turning point in the wake of the National Historic Preservation Act to figure out so what are people and communities going to do with these old industrial heritage sites? One of the plans put forward was to create this national heritage corridor as a kind of category and a catalyst for change. So the map that I've included on this slide is one that we've used very frequently. It delineates all these different communities that are part of a big partnership created in the 1980s. That heritage corridor was very successful. It still exists and it is run and managed by a nonprofit entity today with government funding. And it includes all these places between Worcester, Massachusetts at the headwater of the Blackstone River all the way down to Providence. We don't work in every single one of these communities every day or every week, but we have a relationship with all of these communities and the park grew out of a desire to isolate six of these very special places and combine them into one national historical park. And that happened in 2014. Between 2014 and 2021, there was a lot of work at very high levels to determine so what is this park actually going to be? What are, what are we actually going to be doing? Where are the rangers going to be located? 
I was first hired by this park back in 2016. And the word we were using all the time was boundaries. We didn't yet have boundaries to the park. And that was a bit strange. That is unlike other parks where the boundary is really first and foremost in determining the land that the federal government is going to manage for people. We were working within the bounds of that heritage corridor and figuring out which sites we'd have an affiliation with and what would be given to the American people to protect under the auspices of the park. And this photograph shows the secretary of the Department of the Interior with our representatives for the park areas signing into law the boundary that actually creates that park. Now, I mentioned that people are a very important part of our story, and I wanted to include people as much as possible. Powerful people like the ones that you saw on the previous slide, as well as ordinary people. And ordinary people are really our focus at Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. We're concerned with the evolution of industry within that area, such as the one on the map that I showed you. And we're really interested in how people's lives were changed by particular actions that folks took along that Blackstone River. My office is located in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. So I am based out of the old Slater Mill National Historic Landmark. There is a stone building and a yellow mill building in this photograph right on top of the Blackstone River. And I spend a lot of my time in the stone building, which is an old machine shop. We are very fortunate that in March of 2021, the Old Slater Mill Association decided to give this entire property to the American people to be overseen and managed by the National Park Service. Pointing that out because it's the only thing that the Park Service owns and manages in that whole corridor. So we do work in a whole bunch of places, but this is the only spot where we actually own something. Now the Blackstone River, as I mentioned, is varied and large and is part of a bigger watershed. And across our six sites, we do a lot of interpretation about the river, technology, and people's relationship to that. On the previous slide where we showed Slater Mill and that campus, there is a dam that directly abuts the old mill. And it was actually some natural qualities about the Blackstone River that first got people interested in developing industry in this area. A very large glacier carved out what we now call the Blackstone River Valley. For thousands of years, indigenous people referred to this body of water as Kittikuk. That was one of the names that the river had. Today, it's referred to as the Blackstone in honor of a colonist who came to the area in the 1600s. But for thousands of years, people made a living. People made a life alongside the Blackstone River. And it was part of a very healthy network of bodies of water. Where I am today, I'm right next to the Mishasik, which is another historic watershed that was considered one of the healthiest kind of climates and ecosystems in this part of the world. Colonists start to see this asset and this resource very differently. They are interested in seeing and using the Blackstone River for its potential for water power. A river that had been very carefully managed by indigenous people for thousands of years had been able to support life so successfully because of a carefully maintained balance. The Nipmuc, Wampanoag, Narragansett, and others often turned to this river as a great source for fish. I mentioned this was part of a once very healthy watershed. By the time the yellow mill that you see in this photograph here is in operation in the late 1700s, it was considered only the act of a very lazy person to spend part of their day idly fishing by this river. There is a tremendous change that happens in a fairly short period of time when we look at all of human history, where the river goes from being an amazing natural asset for life to being something that is primarily tapped for industry, for working in mills, and the very idea that you would go to this river as a place to simply enjoy fish and what nature can provide was almost a taboo by the time this mill was fully in operation. And those are some other views of that water.
The Blackstone River drops over 400 feet across about 40 miles from where it starts in Worcester, Massachusetts. If you've been over by the Canal District, that is not far from the headwaters of the Blackstone River. And because it's situated in this beautiful valley, has lots of natural drops. It drops over and over, and it doesn't do that 438 foot drop all at once. Across that 43 or so miles, it drops repeatedly about 10 feet at a time. That made this really prime land for developing the idea of water powered industry. And what I'm showing on this slide is a more contemporary dam of which there are still many on the Blackstone River. The story of industry in the Blackstone really rightfully begins here in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Pawtucket at one part was part of Massachusetts, but that would take a whole other hour to explain. Today, it is part of Rhode Island, so we will talk about it that way. In this colonial area, starting in the mid 1600s, people who actually had been banished from other parts of Massachusetts had started to settle here to run forges and ironworks. And that created a community of tool makers that would be very attractive to later investors. The visual that I have for you today is of naturally occurring falls and a drop that occurs right near the present day site of Slater Mill. There is a beautiful drop that occurs naturally right at this part of the Blackstone River. And this area was chosen first by 17th century colonists to develop industry and then by 18th century industrialists to build a mill. The water that drops, it creates a beautiful climate, a great setup to use water to generate power, to run machines, to run any number of operations. This is where our first kind of important big name figure enters the story. In the late 1700s, a man named Samuel Slater was training basically to become upper management in England. He grew up in a community where he happened to be adjacent to the latest, newest, best technology. At that time, a lot of people in England were investing their money into textiles. The English were set on colonizing different parts of the world to extract certain resources, whether that was tea, spices, or cotton. But locally, they were very interested in using their water power and their natural resources to extract labor, to run mills where people would operate machinery to make clothing. They had this entire global network of consumers and extractors. Right. And on the eve of the American Revolution, that was a big debate. Right. Should people living on this continent in this part of the world be forced to continue buying English goods? While that is happening, Samuel Slater is a boy. He is working in a mill and he is learning how to teach other people how to run spinning frames, how to turn cotton that's been picked somewhere far away in the world into thread. Slater is going to develop the machine that I've pictured on this slide to the side of him. So this is Samuel Slater and his machine. Slater is going to come to the United States and he is going to steal the technology that he has learned in England and break the agreement of his apprenticeship and decide that he wants to run his own mill. Here's the problem with that. He's 21 years old, he has no money, no contacts, and only his own word that he has worked in an English mill for the better part of a decade. He doesn't get very far right away. When he arrives in the port of New York, it's late in 1789, and he is not successful at networking right away. What he doesn't know is that there are people in Pawtucket and in Providence, Rhode Island, who are looking for just such a person to develop machinery with them. Those people include the investor Moses Brown of the famous Brown slave trading family and William Almy, among others. These are people who have the money, they have the access to the capital, and they are buying up land along the Blackstone River in a place where they believe they can run industry. When Slater ends up hearing about this venture, he connects with Moses Brown, who sends for him to come to Rhode Island from New York. Slater arrives in early 1790, and it takes about three years to get a full mill operation going. It takes three years because Slater has grown up in a fully-fledged factory town in England. 
bear in mind that England is at least 10 to 15 years ahead, so to speak, in the textiles kind of arms race. The English have kept their technology secretive, and they have told people like Samuel Slater that they are never to share how they've learned to make or operate machines outside of the country. Now, with the American Revolution, there's a separation. The colonists here, no longer set consumers, are now free citizens if they are free people. They are able to do as they wish. In Rhode Island, there's this strong desire to get local manufacturing going to further break away from that English pattern and that English system. Slater arrives at just the right time. On almost every tour that I give about Samuel Slater, I point out his age, the fact that he's 21 years old. He'd finished a seven-year apprenticeship back in England, and he was never going to be poor. He was basically being trained for upper management in a mill in Belper, England, pretty much the Silicon Valley of his day. That wasn't enough for him for whatever reason. He was driven to have more power and to make more money. And because he's coming right at that turning point where people are no longer thinking of themselves as part of an empire, but truly establishing American engineering and industry, he's coming at just the right time. This is the world that Slater comes from. He's coming from factories that have fully fledged machines from big systems that are all fully operational. And he's arriving in Pawtucket where he has to make everything from scratch with local craftspeople. And I want to point out a human dynamic that's going on. When Slater arrives, again, he's 21 years old. He's staying with local people. He's effectively living in taverns. And two of the wealthiest people in Providence are agreeing to be his business partner because they think he's their best shot at actually copying this English technology. He has to work with craftspeople who on their own have been trying to make copies of English textile machines for years and have failed. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic that he is stepping into. He knows that he needs to create systems for water power, actual machines that will process cotton into thread, and he knows that he needs to get people to buy that finished thread and weave it into cloth and contract with other people, other merchants to get cotton to the mill. So it's like getting a whole world industry to come to this one small building, and he needs to tap into that river to make a system for water power. We at the mill have a recreation of one of the early water wheels. This is an older photograph. Ours is currently under restoration, but this is similar to what they would have run to actually make power inside the mill. So no electricity, of course, but as he gets the mill up and running from 1790 to 1793, there are stories that Slater would develop pretty significant chronic pain later in his life. And part of why he has that chronic pain is he was responsible for getting this wheel to physically start turning. The weight of water is what forces that wheel to turn and is really the core of that water power system. But it's New England. Often there would be ice or other issues with weather. And Slater reported that he single-handedly went outside in all manner of weather and worked this wheel uh, to get it started pretty much six days a week for many years of his life. Now, this is similar to what the mill would have actually looked like when he got started, basically a wooden box with plenty of windows for natural light and several doors, several entryways. This is the historic Moffat Mill, which is located in Lincoln, Rhode Island. It is part of the Heritage Corridor, but it is managed privately. I like to show this picture so you get an idea of what Slater actually started with. Now, we're very fortunate that we have drawings and we have renderings of all different stages of evolution of Slater's mill. We have the very basic box with some windows and some doorways. Uh, only Slater would have held on to the key. And then we have this evolution into a much larger mill including a mill that has a pretty now iconic bell tower where they would call the workers to and from work. That early box shape that we see here today in Pawtucket, I want you to imagine it as a very strange classroom. When Slater would have come into work starting in 1793, 
got all his machines operational. He has everything set up. All of his employees were under 14 years old. Slater did work with adult craftspeople, including recently freed African-Americans in the community, but most of his employees were children around the age of 10. The ultimate preference was to hire young girls. They could be paid the least, but young boys were also hired quite frequently as well. Now, the next chapter of our story takes us out of Pawtucket and into what was considered a wilderness area of northern Rhode Island for many years. Slater arrives, as I mentioned, in 1789, and he has a much younger brother. His brother had stayed behind and also completed an apprenticeship with the mills, and he learns a whole new set of skills that, frankly, Samuel Slater doesn't have. John learns really advanced engineering for the time of how to make a system for water power. When Slater built his mill with local craftspeople, they put it right alongside two powerful natural drops in the Blackstone River, and they dammed that river to get further power to channel it through those water wheels to run their whole system. John stays behind. John is the younger sibling. I feel like I understand certain things about him as a much younger sibling myself. John gets the benefit of spending all this extra time learning about different mill systems and seeing even greater English advances. And then he comes to Rhode Island at his brother's request and automatically gets funding. His brother opens all of these doors for him. And John and later his wife, Ruth, will actually run an entire village community around their mills. This etching shows John Slater later in life. He came when he was also quite young, just outside of being a teenager. And to the side of him is the community that he creates. It's a place that we now call Slatersville. The community that springs up around John Slater's mill in Northern Rhode Island in a place called North Smithfield is not an accident. It is a planned community. When Slater and his investors are looking for a place to land in Pawtucket, they're choosing everything based on the natural assets, the water power that's already there. John has learned advanced engineering and water power technology, so he knows that he just needs a strong body of water and he can make a drop that suits his factory's needs. The community that you see in this photograph, this is from the late 1800s when Slatersville is a fully fledged mill village, a mill with all surrounding outbuildings that serve the purpose of Slater's Corporation. If you were to visit this community today, it actually still looks very similar, minus the trees. A lot of aspects of this mill village have been remarkably preserved, despite the fact that it was created in 1806. This is a close-up of one of the buildings. Again, if you were to visit Slatersville today, you would see these exact buildings, and the park does have an audio tour that you can take that will guide you right around the community. One of the core elements of the evolution that we go from Slater's Mill in Pawtucket to Slatersville in North Smithfield, Rhode Island, is the worker housing. And worker housing is a big part of our story. If you've been to a factory city such as Lowell, Massachusetts, created circa 1826, you see rows of boarding houses, either wood or brick, all designed for dormitory style housing for workers. That is not what they did in Northern Rhode Island and elsewhere in the Blackstone Valley. They recruited families to live in small duplexes, small box shaped houses. The one on this slide is very typical of what Slaters had built for their workers in Northern Rhode Island. Very simple duplex, either one front door or two front doors and multiple families living under one roof. John Slater himself and his wife, Ruth, they actually lived in one of these worker duplexes. At the core of the community is the church. And just behind the church is actually John Slater's house in Slatersville. The church was extremely important to John and Ruth, not just because they were devout, but because they firmly believed that the church was almost as important as any discipline in the mill. If you lived in a mill village such as Slatersville, your work week, Monday through Saturday, was dictated by the mill owners, by the Slaters. 
your Sunday was spent worshiping in this church. Now, over time, there's going to be differences. There's going to be more churches added. But the Slaters did something kind of interesting in this part of Northern Rhode Island. This green that accompanies this Slatersville Common looks like just about every other old colonial community in Massachusetts. But that's weird for Rhode Island. Rhode Islanders left, or people who became Rhode Islanders, those colonists left Massachusetts to not make their church the center of their community. We have very few communities in Rhode Island that look like this, with a church and a green at the center and housing and a mill emanating out. The Slaters wanted their community to feel like a very traditional English mill village. That's exactly what they created. Now, something starts to change in the wake of these successful communities. We have Slater's Experimental Mill, circa 1793, Slatersville, 1806, and after the War of 1812, we now have hundreds of mills springing up all along the Blackstone River. This inspires people to want to invest in the next thing, which is a canal. And this old woodcut shows a small canal boat traveling up, um, going towards a place called Millbury, Massachusetts. Remember, I mentioned that the Blackstone flows through a valley. Now, that's wonderful for industry because you have drops just about every 10 feet or, or sorry, 10 feet just about every mile. Think of that same amount of changes of elevation. And then think about digging out the earth to make a consistent waterway that will go from Providence to Worcester. In a remarkably short period of time, four years, people hand dig out with very few elements for blasting a canal, a human-made waterway where they can start to move all of the stuff that they're making in these mills. The canal lasts for about 20 years before it is eclipsed by the coming of the train. And this is a wonderful shot because it actually shows a train coming towards us alongside the old Blackstone Canal. I'll talk a bit about what the canal is used for today, where it exists. That shot is one that we usually use to talk about of the evolution of how mill villages get bigger. And I promise we're leaving Rhode Island really soon. After places like Slatersville, you see more and more investors wanting to make money in a way that is twofold. They want to run mills or factories, but more importantly, they want to run everything around workers' lives. So they want to invest in a company such as the mill that was located at this site in historic Ashton, Rhode Island, and they want to build all kinds of worker housing. The brick row houses that you see in this photograph are all pretty much identical. And if you were to leave this site in Blackstone River State Park and drive a few minutes in almost any direction, you'll see this over and over. Part of why our story in the Blackstone is significant is we're not talking about one spectacularly interesting event. We're talking about the creation of a pattern that's going to play out over and over repeatedly across first a corridor, an area of the United States, and eventually many parts of the world. From there, I want to take us to Whitensville, Massachusetts, which is one of our park sites in uh, the northern part of the Blackstone Valley. The Whitensville uh, site is not properly right on top of the Blackstone. It actually connects to a tributary of the Blackstone River. But part of why we're there is this site was once one of the largest creators of textile machinery in the world. It was home to a family business called the Whiten Machine Works. I mentioned that we have John and Samuel Slater, who are older and younger brothers. In Whitensville, we have a slightly different dynamic. We have a family business that's built on marriage. We have a man named James Fletcher, who is a colonial Revolutionary War soldier who marries really well. He marries a woman named Margaret, whose family owned the land that we're seeing in this photograph, really prime land next to a great drop in the Branch River that he wants to use to run a forge. His daughter, a woman named Betsy, is also going to marry a soldier, and that soldier is named Paul Whiten. Mr. Whiten is going to have a lot of interest in developing industry with his father-in-law who is running a forge. That forge does still exist today. 
It's located opposite the mill that I've shown in this slide. And together, these different generations of a family are going to create the white and machine works. That is one of the largest textile machine producers in the 1800s. When we started with Samuel Slater in the Valley in 1793, he was just trying to get child laborers to work a small series of machines that made thread. That is what really started off this evolution of people wanting to make more aspects of industry. So we have this small experiment and then this idea of what if there's an entire community around the mill and what if the mill owner owns that entire community? This is the next phase. In this community, we have people who not only own the entire community and they own a cotton spinning mill, which is what you're seeing right here. They own the company, later corporation, that makes all the machines for other nearby operations. So it's this constant kind of leveling up in complexity of industry. If you were to visit Whitensville today, we have yet another beautiful village green as seen on this map. You can see aspects of that old machine shop and the huge white and machine works even now. And we do have a guided tour that you can take by yourself if you choose to visit this community. Wanted to show you that water power and another kind of view of this. On the left side of this photograph, we have an old red brick mill that was the start of this family business. And opposite, we have the white and machine works, which literally takes up basically an entire block. And that was this massive production center. Families like this, they kept business in the family. They married very strategically. They often married and connected with people who owned things like plantations in the American South. And they made sure that the investment stayed in the community and their own real estate and their own community institutions. That is a big part of the story that we tell when we do tours at places like this. Now, our last stop is a place called Hopedale, Massachusetts. Hopedale is also part of the Blackstone River Valley and also not directly on top of the Blackstone River. It is also on a tributary, but it's a fantastic example of how a small community enterprise turned into a company town. Hopedale, as you see on the sign here, is one of many places where you can still find heritage corridor signage. That signage will let you know that you're in the Heritage Corridor and will give you some guidance as to where to go around the community. We also have a self-guided audio tour on our app and on our website. Hopedale was actually founded as a radical commune in 1842. So again, this is our next kind of evolution in this story. Slatersville, 1806. These other communities growing up around the canal, 1820s, 1830s. Whiten starting to get some affluence around that time. And people in the 1840s were often distraught. They had a whole millennial culture, not millennial like I'm a millennial being 35, but millennial like I think the world is going to end. It was a very distraught time for a lot of people. Folks such as Henry David Thoreau and others decided to pull out of modern society, sort of like hippies and people who would, you know, fall out in, in later years. The folks who created Hopedale wanted a radical commune where all of their beliefs could coexist freely. They believed in ending slavery, women's rights, voting for all, and many other radical things. Two of the early members of that community were part of a family that had inherited patents on textile machinery. So they ran a small shop where they created parts for other machines. From that grew the massive complex that you see in the photograph on the right of this slide, this multi-million square foot corporation. As that business grew, a lot of those values of the early commune were dissolved, and it became a fully-fledged company town, just like a place such as Pullman out in Illinois, or a site such as Fordlandia, run by the Henry Ford Company. Now, this is the factory vacant. This is not a place where they make things anymore. And very recently, this massive complex was demolished starting just two years ago. So it's in kind of the sunset of its life. People still paddle and they recreate all along the beautiful Mill River that's next to the factory, but it's gone. 
obviously I haven't talked a ton about the intervening years about huge infrastructure projects such as this viaduct that really changed the Blackstone Valley. But what happens after the first hundred or so years of industry is a gradual decline, is a decline that leads to the creation of mills being museums and housing as opposed to mills being mills. Am I frozen? One of the crises that comes out of this is a lot of these company towns and mill villages where people had hyper invested in their communities for decades. The companies dissolve, the tax base dissolves, everything goes away, and people are left with a very dirty river that has been polluted now for many generations. One of, I think, the most remarkable stories about the Blackstone Valley is ordinary people made mills possible. It was the labor of ordinary people that made these places run. And ordinary people who were tired of having a dirty, polluted, post-industrial river physically cleaned it themselves starting in the 1970s. These were people who had worked in industry or lived alongside industry and they were at the forefront of the environmental movement to undo a lot of these consequences. Today, there are many times of year where you can paddle the Blackstone River and you can actually enjoy it and appreciate it. I like talking about this as a revolution because a full revolution takes us all the way back around. We do have very little industry on the Blackstone today. But we also have people who turn to the river as a source of calm and recreation, just as they would have hundreds and then thousands of years ago. We do our best to honor the stories of working people in lots of ways. We do guided paddle tours, guided bike tours, walking tours, towpath talks, all sorts of things that I'm happy to promote. And we work really hard to incorporate the arts into a lot of what we do. This is a photograph of dancers making an interpretive dance inside of Slater Mill, totally contrary to the idea of what a factory is, where people stand mute at a machine and make the same thing over and over with no appreciation for their talent or skill. I really encourage you to come out and visit us. We would love to take you on a tour of one of these six places, and we do have special events that we think are particularly exciting. We are debuting a video about the first wage worker strike that happened in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, this upcoming weekend, April 22nd, and we will be reopening the mill after this warm winter for tours starting on May 11th and punctuating that opening with a special festival all about the first wage worker strike that happened in Pawtucket. Every Wednesday, we read special uh, bike rides in the summer. We have Thursday night walking tours and we do special commemorations all throughout the year. So I hope that you will look us up and follow us or find us. And I would love to see you in the Valley. But Allison, wonderful job. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Let me spotlight you. Uh, yeah. So we're gonna have some questions and comments now. We've got about 15 minutes or so. Margaret says, excellent presentation. Sue says, great job. Debbie says, excellent talk. Linda says, I appreciate the depth and focus of this presentation and the invitation to the events coming up this year. Faye says, spectacular job of presenting. Thanks so much. I am grateful to have virtually met the various families whose vision created this rich history. Keep up with the great work. Uh, Scott says, your presentation is very, very good. You are an excellent speaker <laughs> and a visit. credit to the Park Service. Pamela points out that Maynard has uh, those uh, small mill work, worker houses as well. Uh, Renee pointed out a potential typo, which I will forward along to you. Frances says, what a great program. Kathy says, you convinced me to visit. Amy says, fabulous. Madeline says, I learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, uh, they're curious about the emphasis of the mill owners on providing a church for mill workers. Did the mill owners hire and fire the preachers and did they have any influence on the teachings? The short answer is yes. And so there were communities, uh, even very early mill communities where people worshiped differently or worshiped 
as they wished, whenever they wished. But very quickly, people like John Slater saw a huge advantage to controlling how people would worship. And part of this came from his wife, who was, in fact, just an incredibly devout person. But part of what's really striking about the Slaters, particularly, is they're really benefiting from the fact that the American Revolution has occurred and that local people are trying to invest in industry and separate from British manufacturing. But the Slaters are also deeply invested in basically just recreating what they had back in England, creating the same kind of system of churches, schools, housing, worker setups, you know, in machine shops and in mills. We know for a fact that in Slatersville, the way that people were suggested to worship was influenced by the mill owners. And we know that they hired and fired the preachers. That would continue in factory cities such as Lowell. We also know that even, again, in a place like Pullman, Illinois, like a very famous company town, there were often options for how people worshiped, but there was still control from the top. Uh, ML asks, is there a bike path along the river from Worcester to uh, Pawtucket? I actually had that on a slide and I deleted it, but our nonprofit partners, the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, they absolutely promote the bikeway. It is a two-state effort, so it does get federal funding, but it's a state project in each state. So major portions are done in each state, but it's not a direct bike path. So if you get on the path in Worcester, Massachusetts, you can get to Providence and continue to the East Bay bike path, but you will be on the road at some points. Uh, Pamela says, thank you. This was excellent. Where can we walk along the towpath and for how far is the towpath separate from the bike path? So there are places where they are very close. A lot of the contemporary bike path follows um, a rail to trail format, right? So a lot of places where there were old railroads or canal paths in the country, there are now bike paths. The Blackstone is no different. There are a lot of places where the bike path is literally what the towpath for the canal used to be. And there are places where they diverge or are next to each other. I recommend uh, Blackstone River State Park. That's a fantastic place to land, take one of our audio tours or one of our guided tours. And we will be walking the towpath every Saturday this summer and doing a guided talk at 1 p.m. So we would love to see folks for that. I also just recommend um, there's great Blackstone Canal history on our website. And once you know where to look for it, you won't miss it. So it's still there, except for where it's buried. <laughs> uh, Renee asks, was there a relationship between Waltham and any of the communities in the Blackstone Valley? That's a great question. So we answer questions about Lowell and Waltham pretty much every day, as well as Patterson. And I was a park ranger at Lowell for about four years. So I feel okay answering that question. They're different investors. And so they end up being very similar, but these early investments are primarily from Providence merchants. It's Providence merchants working with duplicitous English people like the Slaters who get this going and it's Providence wealth. And to just be, you know, straight with that, that's wealth from the slave trade. Rhode Island had some of the wealthiest communities in the world because of the slave trade. And that's really the genesis of that funding. What you're seeing in Waltham and then later in Lowell, Lawrence, Amuskeag, all those communities, not terribly different, but you're seeing a slightly later timeline you're seeing Boston-based merchants like Beacon Hill types who are investing in the second wave of industry. If you were to look at the early waves of the tech boom in the United States, you had people who were in very experimental setups, and then you had a big group of investors really come in later, very serious money. Think of this as the experimental phase with considerable money from world trade, and then think of that second phase like Waltham as being Boston and Charles River area investors. Waltham is successful. Waltham, you know, the enterprise that grew up there worked fine. They knew they couldn't scale up. So the reason why you have the evolution of these communities is people are interested in scale. 
Slater Mill functioned just fine right next to the Blackstone River, but you couldn't build mill after mill right on top of that site. You needed a system of water power, which Boston merchants learn from that mistake and invest differently. They invest in water power systems together, which is where you get the evolution from a Waltham to a Lowell and beyond. Uh, Lindsay asks, can you describe the process to becoming a national historical park back in 2014? It's a great question. So it was a very long process and starting with the creation of the National Heritage Corridor in the 1980s, that was an extremely successful venture and still is, but heritage corridors don't have the same promised longevity as a national historical park or a national park. And many community investors uh, thought it was, uh, or local people thought it was important to have that security and longevity. You can have a sunset date on a national heritage corridor. National parks have a different kind of promise from the federal government. So there was a lot of local energy, a lot of support, and portions of the heritage corridor morphed into the park. So it wasn't like one replaced the other. It was kind of a gradual change that took place. That was established formally in December of 2014. It took about seven years to get the secretary to actually firmly establish those boundaries in 2021. And that included uh, soon after the, uh, the acquisition of Slater Mill. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to jump around a little bit, uh, Allison. Yeah. So Pamela would like to know, were some of the people banished to this area Quakers? Great question. So I'm currently in Providence, Rhode Island, which I would not say was anti-Quaker, but Roger Williams, who created the colony here, right, and created the establishment after being pushed out of Massachusetts, really was not very fond of Quakers and actually debated them quite openly. The large Quaker settlement was in the southern part of the state, in a place called Aquidneck Island, what we would now think of as Newport and Middletown, Rhode Island today. So I wouldn't say no Quakers. There were Quakers in later days, um, particularly in the 1700s, places like Uxbridge, Massachusetts, as well as Northern Rhode Island. But very early days, um, it wasn't like a magnet for Quakers, but there would be Quaker settlements here. And uh, Renee asks, so what were the roles in life of Africans, uh, both enslaved and free, and what about any local indigenous people? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. So to the first part of your question, something we highlight far more now at places like Slater Mill is that recently liberated Black African Americans who were living in the Providence County area, many of whom were connected to mill investors, did work on making the early mills. They did physical construction work, made baskets, manually turned machines, and did all kinds of labor. Once the mills were open in earnest, the preference was to hire local non-Black children. So almost never worked in them again. We have very few numbers. We're embarking on about a two-year research project to talk more about that. But part of what happened when these mills were first opening is gradual emancipation had just passed in the state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island passes that in 1784, and there are still people enslaved until the 1840s. So it's a tremendously long period of time. The story that we tell most often is about the exclusion of Black laborers on the one hand, uh, and the profit from products sold back to Black laborers. So Northbridge, the community I showed with the white and machine works, in that area, there was a huge population of people who made shoes just for enslaved African Americans, a large population of people who made cloth just for African Americans, and tools, uh, including cotton pickers and scythes that were sold back to plantations. So that's probably our biggest story in terms of numbers. We work very closely with different indigenous communities. On May 21, we are hosting an intertribal gathering at Slater Mill, and that will be a gathering of the Wampanoag, Narragansett, and Nipmuc. So we welcome you to come to that. Uh, we're going to start to wind it down here, Allison. Uh, Marjorie says that this was a great talk. This area is on our date day list, mm -hmm. and uh, she plans on visiting in June. Uh, Madeline says, I learned a lot. 
Patricia says, this was all new information to me. Uh, congratulations on having all this knowledge. Suzanne says she enjoyed the presentation. It's a beautiful area. Lindsay says, great talk, thank you. Uh, there's about a handful of questions in the chat, but I think I'm gonna try to save those, Allison. Sure. And I will forward those to you. Um, Allison, do you have any uh, last words for the audience before we wrap up? No, just that I'm happy to take emails. I love when people follow up. It's my first underscore last name at mps.gov. I'm always very happy to share that. Someone recognizes me from another park. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to answer emails. And um, I, I love these other questions. I'm just seeing them about cleanups and things. But please feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm very happy to talk. So. Yeah, Allison, in the follow-up email I send later today, I'll, I'll include your email address and encourage people to reach out to you directly if they have any additional questions yeah, uh, that we for didn't sure. get to. Uh, for sure. feel, feel free to type that into the chat if you want, but no worries. Um, and folks, uh, several folks have referenced Lowell. Uh, we're going to see Lowell uh, in about uh, five or six weeks. Uh, but next week, we're getting a visit from the Salem Maritime National Historic Site that's a week from today, Wednesday, April 26th at 12 o'clock. So very much looking forward to that. So let's give Allison one last big virtual round of applause. Uh, Allison did a wonderful job as expected. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys uh, the rest of their day and I hope to see many of you uh, next week. So thank you all and have a great day. Thanks thank again, you. Allison. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye all.